All right, we're all ready now. I have the opportunity to introduce Ben Needy and his wonderful talk on thunderstorms, lightning, and lightning strikes on aircraft. <laughs> Take it away, Ben. Thank you for the introduction, Adam, and uh, thank you guys all for coming. Um, so by now you've probably noticed that it is indeed Friday the 13th, and you are here listening to a talk about lightning. Uh, and earlier this week I was going to say, ah, but that's okay, it's not bad luck. Um, you know, there's, you're definitely not going to get struck by lightning when you leave here because thunderstorms never happen in Minnesota in the winter. And then we had thunder snow on Tuesday, so good luck. Um, <laughs> Thunderstorms, um, they're towering, often beautiful, high energy masses of air, uh, giving rise to ferocious downpours. Uh, and they're, 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 they're really lovely too. Um, if you've ever had the opportunity to be outside in the middle of a thunderstorm, and I highly recommend it, uh, you know that there's, there's, really this, there, there, there's really a sense of power, and, and you've gotta imagine that there's some cool physics going on. And indeed there is. Um, Thunderstorms are, in essence, thermodynamic systems, and uh, shortly I'll, I'll delve into why, how they form, and what goes on within them. Um, they're also scary. Thunderstorms give rise to lightning, of course, and lightning uh, kills 100 people in the United States every year, um, and injures about 1,000 more. Um, and beyond that, only about a quarter of the lightning strikes um, that uh, happen actually ever hit the ground. So we really only notice about a quarter of lightning strikes. There's a lot more going on within the clouds. And so you've got to wonder, well, isn't it pretty uh, dangerous to be flying in an airplane through a thunderstorm? Uh, what's going to happen? So let's start uh, with uh, Quizlet. <laughs> so say that you are flying along in an airplane when flash, something, something happens. The white blinding flash. What do you think the most likely explanation is? A, the airplane was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time, and uh, there was a lightning bolt, and the airplane intercepted it, and, and bang. <coughs> B, the airplane actually caused the lightning somehow. Something about the fact that the airplane was in that storm made the lightning happen. And C, don't be silly, Ben. That definitely was not lightning. Um, an aircraft doesn't provide a path to the ground, right? There's a lot of charge in this cloud that's trying to get to ground. The, the airplane hasn't been on the ground for a long time. Why would it strike the airplane? So by show of hands, who thinks that it is option A? Okay. Um, <laughs> who thinks it's option B? <laughs> who thinks it's option C? <laughs> um, well, we will, uh, many of you may have uh, chosen the correct answer, but we'll get into actually why that's correct. And, uh, um, and, and so, uh, let's go into an outline of the talk. Uh, first, I'll be talking about thunderstorms, so I'll, I'll go over a thermodynamic formulation of how thunderstorms form and uh, what a mature thundercloud looks like. Um, then I'll talk about lightning, both from an E and M perspective and from uh, a mechanics perspective, actually. And finally, we'll get back to this question of what happens when aircraft and lightning interact. So, thundercloud formation. Um, I'm gonna talk about thunderstorms in two chunks. First, I'll talk about how the storm forms and then what happens in a mature storm. Thundercloud formation requires two key elements. The first is a parcel of warm, moist air, and the second is an upward buoyant force to push this parcel of air upward through the atmosphere. As we'll see shortly, um, this signature uh, anvil shape that thunderclouds take on uh, frequently is a direct consequence of uh, the motion of moist air parcels upward in our atmosphere. Now you might be wondering, what is a parcel of air? Well, according to Barry's 1987 uh, atmospheric physics, an air parcel is a blob of air, small enough, <laughs> small enough that it will retain its own thermodynamic identity, which distinguishes it from its surrounding air masses. Um, and so what you can think of is sort of this chunk of air um, floating in the atmosphere uh, that is sufficiently unique from all the surrounding air that we can think of it as its own unique thing. Um, Barry goes on to uh, discuss how the motion of air parcels in our atmosphere it can actually be, dis um, can actually be uh, thought of as adiabatic because uh, the thermal conductivity of air is actually quite low. 
Um, and this will prove to be a very important concept um, going forward. Uh, you might also, also be wondering about scale. Um, it depends on who you talk to. An error parcel can range in scale from a few centimeters, some say, to 1,600 kilometers, others say. So that's a big range, of course. It just depends on what you want to talk about. Um, in my case, I'll, I'll generally be referring to something on the order of about 10 kilometers um, in diameter. So now let's take an in-depth look at how air parcels move through the atmosphere and how that leads to uh, thunderstorm formation. So what we have here is your classic PT diagram, a phase diagram. Um, temperature on the horizontal axis and pressure on the vertical axis with the three um, phases of water uh, in their respective uh, places and uh, phase transition lines drawn in black. Um, of course, like usual PT diagrams, this is not at all to scale. It simply uh, magnifies the important parts. The one uh, thing that might make you say, whoa, is that there's uh, altitude drawn in here that doesn't usually get, um, get drawn. And the reason it's upside down is that as you think, if you think about it, if we go up in the atmosphere, our altitude increases, the pressure decreases. I could have turned the chart upside down, but I think that would annoy you more. Than <laughs> so uh, altitude is down, just remember that. Now let's put it over to the side, and I'll bring in another diagram. Um, this is a schematic of Earth's lower atmosphere. Uh, down here is the ground, so here's the Earth, and altitude increases up. On the right here, we have a temperature scale. So uh, the blue regions are colder, the red regions are higher. And what you'll notice is this interesting uh, behavior where we actually have a local maximum, a minimum in temperature, uh, about 10 kilometers and up, um, at a level known as the tropopause. So what's going on here is that uh, at low levels, from about zero to 10 <coughs> kilometers or so, um, in the, what's known as the troposphere, uh, temperature decreases as a function of height because uh, the heating usually occurs uh, because of the surface heating through the sun absorbing. Um, and above that, in the stratosphere, that gives away to solar heating, which actually, is, which means that temperature actually increases as a function of height again. And what we end up with is a local minimum in the middle. Um, now, we'll begin our story on a hot, sticky summer day in Northfield, Minnesota, um, where the sun shines <coughs> down on the earth. <laughs> uh, so the sun warms the ground, the ground warms the surrounding air, and what we end up with is a parcel of warm, moist air. So why is the air moist? Why do we say that? Well, it means that the air has two components. First, it has dry air, which is just molecular nitrogen, oxygen, etc. And the second is it has water. Um, this water right now is existing as water vapor in the gaseous phase. And that's because, of course, uh, we are not at saturation. We haven't reached a dew point temperature, in other words. Um, but uh, moist air could also contain saturated, um, the, the condensed phases of matter. Uh, that's just not what we have right now. So right now I'm going to hide the sun. Um, it's a little bit distracting, but just remember that um, as the sun, as as Cal always is in Olin, uh, the sun is always going to stay here. It's going to keep shining down, warming the ground, and going to create more air parcels. So bye bye. Um, what I've done here now is I'm going to plot the uh, pressure and temperature of the water in this moist air parcel on the PT diagram. Uh, so right now we have uh, the altitude is at the ground. Um, and the pressure is the pressure at the ground, and the temperature is the temperature of the, of the water at the ground. And remember that that is going to be slightly warmer than the surroundings, because this has been warmed by the sun. Um, you'll also remember that this is uh, adiabatic, this can undergo adiabatic motion, so it will expand and cool adiabatically, um, like so. The, the, um, the temperature is higher, so the pressure um, so temperature is higher, so the air parcel will expand, the pressure will be lower, and it will rise. Then it will cool adiabatically. And we can also plot this motion on the PT diagram with this blue arrow. Um, and you'll notice that as we increase in altitude, increase in altitude going down, um, temperature is decreasing, and temperature is decreasing to the left. Um, you might also see that this diagram is getting suspiciously close to the condensation line, the phase transition between liquid and uh, water vapor. And that is because as we cool, the, 
um, you might think of it as the air can hold less water. Um, we're getting closer to saturation or we're getting closer to the dew point, dew point temperature. And indeed, um, at about a kilometer high, we'll get to a level known as the lifting condensation level, or LCL. At the lifting condensation level, um, the, the uh, dew point temperature is reached. So here we are at the dew point temperature. And uh, uh, water vapor will condense onto dust particles in the air, um, creating uh, the gray, fluffy stuff in the sky that we see known as clouds. So I'll color it gray. <clears throat> and of course, now the cloud is saturated. So once, um, <coughs> so now that the cloud is saturated, the fact that we um, started on a um, hot, sticky summer day where there's a ton of uh, water in the atmosphere is very important to us um, because latent heat released by condensation um, will warm the cloud and keeping it and keep it warmer than the surroundings. It's going to actually counteract atmospheric cooling. So as this cloud continues to expand and rise, it's going to stay a little bit warmer than the surroundings. And the, uh, the energy for this is coming from the latent heat stored in this transition between uh, water vapor and liquid water. So we want a lot of moisture to make this happen. Um, the cloud will continue to, oops, continue to rise and expand, um, getting larger and colder. Uh, and lower in pressure, and it will even keep going as we get into the, um, the region in which ice crystals will form. Uh, so now we'll have a mixture of um, ice crystals and water vapor up here at the top. And this upward motion will increase until um, the latent heat can no longer supply enough energy to keep the cloud rising, and this level is known at as the level of neutral buoyancy, or LNB. The LNB usually occurs right above the tropopause where stratospheric um, warming begins again uh, because no matter how much more heat uh, the transition puts out, the, uh, the cloud will not be able to be any warmer than the surroundings anymore. Um, so remember now that uh, <coughs> the sun has still been warming the ground, and so more moist air particles have been forming. I've kind of drawn this as three or four discrete chunks of air. In reality, we have more of a continuous um, tube of air rising, or a, a warm, moist updraft. And so what we'll see is something like this, where the air uh, rises and expands against the ceiling, um, which is the level of neutral buoyancy. Um, so now let's. So now at this point we have a full, mature thundercloud, which is which is composed of a warm, moist updraft, and we're ready to look at what causes the precipitation. So moving on to the next diagram, um, this one is drawn a little bit more to scale. Uh, a typical thundercloud will be about 10 kilometers across, 10 kilometers tall. Um, these dark blue arrows, the uh, the solid arrows represent the, the <coughs> draft that we just finished um, talking about. This is the motion of warm, moist air upwards to the level of neutral buoyancy. And um, uh, after reaching the level of neutral buoyancy, air parcel will, the air parcels will use up their remaining water um, and turning that into latent heat um, to try to keep the cloud rising, but of course they'll fail and all the contents of the clouds will crash down. Now the contents are, um, uh, ice crystals and uh, and uh, uh, liquid water. So precipitation. Precipitation is going to fall through the cloud. Um, this is the stage in the storm where we're going to see uh, a lot of uh, uh, the torrential rain and hail. Um, and something about this process, which we'll get into later, is also going to lead to lightning strikes. Um, now, what's What's happening when this precipitation falls through the cloud is that we're getting cool downdrafts that are counteracting our warm, moist updrafts. Um, they're actually going to start to edge out the warm updrafts until um, uh, lightning is going to start to peter out. And about uh, 15, minute, 15 to 30 minutes after the level of neutral buoyancy was first reached, uh, all of the lightning is going to stop and um, all upward motion is going to cease. Rain will continue for a few more minutes until all the cloud's moisture is used up. And about 
uh, one to two hours after the first air parcels began to rise from the ground um, and turn into clouds, uh, the, the storm is just going to dissipate. Now, if you say, hey, but I have seen a thunderstorm that lasts longer than uh, you know, 15 to 30 minutes of rain, that's because you've actually witnessed multiple thunderstorms rolling through the area, systems of storms, and uh, those have all been on slightly different schedules, so you've kind of witnessed a longer event. But each, each storm is a fairly short um, happening. So now we have uh, a feel for uh, how thunderstorms form and what they do. So let's move into um, lightning. Okay, so lightning is, in essence, a mechanism for moving charge from the cloud to the ground. In this case, charge is being moved, negative charge is being moved <coughs> from the ground. Lightning can also move charge between <coughs> clouds, and in fact, as I said previously, um, most lightning does, never even reaches the ground, uh, but we are able to observe lightning that hits the ground, and so we've studied it a lot more. It's very hard to study um, uh, cloud to cloud lightning. So I'm primarily going to discuss cloud to ground lightning, and specifically negative cloud to ground lightning, which is far and away, um, mo except mostly in Japan, the, um, it, 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 yeah, but it's true, um, the, uh, <laughs> um, is, uh, the uh, most common type of cloud to ground lightning. So the lightning section is going to take, uh, it's going to have two key points. The first is we're going to discuss the charge distribution of the lightning, and then I'll walk through the mechanism of the actual lightning discharge itself. How does this charge distribution lead to um, uh, the flash that we see lighting up the next sky? So <clears throat> the charge distribution. Imagine um, a thundercloud hovering above the ground, and uh, what here is kind of the zero point, and off we can go plus five or minus five kilometers. So once again, this cloud is about 10 kilometers wide. And from now on, I'm gonna call uh, vertically upward that way, the Z hat direction. And imagine a scientist, a random scientist, standing beneath a thundercloud with an electric field meter. <laughs> um, so this scientist is tasked with um, walking 15 kilometers in either direction in a line beneath the thundercloud and taking um, an electric field total electric field measurements at every point beneath the thundercloud. So we'll go 15 kilometers in that direction, negative 15 kilometers in that direction. And what he's gonna get is something that resembles this. So here we have a plot of the electric field as a function of the <coughs> horizontal displacement um, along the ground. What you'll notice is that at the zero point where he's standing right now, um, we, we expect to see a large negative electric field, meaning that um, negative charge is actually going to want to flow up um, and off to the sides uh, about five kilometers out at the edges we're going to see a large positive <coughs> electric field meaning that negative charge is going to want to flow from the cloud to the ground um, why do we why would we do a measurement like this well turns out it's very difficult to take in situ measurements of uh, the distance of the um, charge distribution within thunderclouds. It's a pretty high strat environment. We can try to fly um, weather balloons through thunderclouds, but they typically will actually just get ripped apart or <coughs> completely blown off course. Um, fixed wing aircraft, flying them through uh, thunderclouds uh, can work, but it's very important to be at the right place at the right time. You can't just sort of stop and wait, take a lot of measurements. Um, and even then, it's a fairly treacherous endeavor. <coughs> to fly through a thunderstorm if you can help it. Um, so what scientists do typically is that they will take measurements along the ground and then work backwards to try to see what sort of charge distribution um, could lead to this electric field. Um, and what they found is that this is a very um, typical charge <coughs> distribution for your normal thunderstorm. <coughs> What you'll observe is that there's a large negative charge center, which I've labeled QN, uh, in the middle of the cloud, and a large positive charge center towards the top um, of about the same magnitude. And then there's a much weaker lower positive uh, charge center. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, um, how does this charge distribution lead to this 
uh, this sort of electric field. And um, to do that, let's go and look at uh, some EM. Do so you remember from electricity and magnetism that uh, you might have this sort of a problem? You'll have a charge, negative Q, hovering a distance h above um, the ground. And you're standing at point P, a distance r uh, horizontally from h. And you say, I want to know what the total electric field is here. Well, the easiest way to do that is using the method of images. The method of images says that what we can do is we can actually um, mirror our charge, negative Q, across the grounded plane, like this. And then if we ignore the grounded plane um, and simply take the electric field components as a function, or well, due to negative Q and Q image, <coughs> excuse me, we can sum these two components together and get the total electric field at point P um, in the original situation. So all we have to do is um, consider these two point charges um, at P. And you'll notice that uh, E corresponds to the electric field at P due to negative Q because uh, negative uh, positive charge is going to want to flow towards negative Q. Positive charge is going to want to flow away from positive Q. <coughs> so back to real life. Um, we'll look here at, uh, we'll, we'll basically take this in three components. So ultimately what we're looking for is the electric field, um, uh, the total electric field, so E total, um, <coughs> as a function of R, the distance along the ground. And we can use superposition to say that that will simply be the electric field um, due to each one of these three charge centers, um, cons uh, considering this to be a three-point cloud. Um, uh, so we can just sum them together. So first we'll have the electric field due to the charge P as a function of R, um, and the electric field due to the negative charge as a function of R, and finally the lower positive um, equivalent. And uh, so let's walk through um, one example, the negative one, and this, the others will fall out similarly. You'll first notice that um, the two components of the electric field due to the charge and its image are equal in magnitude, though not in direction. So we can write um, the electric field minus the magnitude is equal to the field plus. And, um, both of those are by um, the, uh, the electric field version of Coulomb's law are just equal to K <coughs> times the magnitude of charge, Qn, over R squared, where R squared is the distance between uh, the point and point P and our charge. And let's rewrite R squared um, using the Pythagorean theorem as H squared plus little r squared because we ultimately want this to be a function of just our uh, horizontal displacement. Now, uh, the total electric field at point P due to the negative charge, E sub n, is simply twice the um, horizontal, no, twice the vertical components of either E minus or E plus. Um, and so we can write that as twice uh, E plus or E minus um, times the sine of alpha uh, to take just the vertical component in the z hat direction. And uh, E plus, we already know what this is. This is equal to um, 2K times the magnitude of QN, uh, H squared plus R squared. And sine alpha, we can write as a ratio of side length. So that's an H on top. Um, that's the opposite side uh, right here. And uh, a factor of H squared over R squared is so one half on the bottom, the hypotenuse. So we get three halves down there in the Z hat direction. And you'll see that now this is a complete expression as a function of R for just the um, electric field due to the name of charge. H is known, it's right here, it's at, uh, seven kilometers. Uh, K is a constant, and um, R is the variable that we want to plot as a function of. Similarly, we can go to the positive charge um, and uh, see that all that's happened really is uh, now there's a positive charge up here, so our electric fields are going to be reversed. We'll get a negative sign um, right up front here. This would be negative, and the H values would change. Uh, uh, the Q would also technically change, although they're both equal to 48 coulombs. 
um, and I similarly <coughs> for the lower positive charge. So now we would just take these two expressions, sum them, and we would have the total length <coughs> field, and if we plotted that, it would look like this. Here, um, I've drawn in dark black the total electric field, and uh, you'll notice that la that looks suspiciously similar to what um, our scientists observed beneath the thundercloud, which was like that. Uh, EN, EP, and ELP, the three components of the electric field, uh, I've plotted here as various types of dashed lines. For example, here, EN is uh, this sort of, is this uh, equation, and as you might expect, large negative charge, you'll get a large positive component of the electric field at the origin, but that is uh, actually uh, cancel that and kind of won over by the two um, positive charges above and below it um, here and here, which bring the center of the electric, the total electric field to be negative in total. Um, so, great. We know that this, this charge is a good model for what exists in a thundercloud, but what causes the distribution? Why, why is it there? Why is it there? And unfortunately, the answer is we don't know. Um, there are some theories. Specifically, there are two types of theories that exist. Uh, the first is, is that there's some sort of inductive or convective mechanism. Um, and what this would involve is that uh, something exterior to the thundercloud comes in, creates a check separation of charge, and then the convective nature of the thunderstorm, that is the upwards motion of warm moist air and the downwards motion of cool air precipitation um, <coughs> distributes the charge throughout the thundercloud appropriately so that it would end up in these places. Um, this until about last year was actually, most people had given up on inductive mechanisms for thunderstorms, but last year a paper was published talking about how cosmic rays and the, and the um, radiation that they produce, if you were at Carolyn's talk last Friday, um, may actually create the charge separation. Um, and that is an interesting avenue that hopefully uh, more thought will be put into soon. Um, on the other hand, the more conservative, or the, the more traditional explanation um, involves <coughs> non-inductive mechanisms. And this said, these say basically uh, something about the way that particles within the thunderstorm, so ice crystals and um, precipitation, interact and rub against each other when they collide. Um, is different at different temperatures. So as you'll imagine, it's really cold, like negative 50 C up here, and it's warmer and warmer still down there. Um, and something about the way that water rubs off and is accreted onto uh, ice crystals at different altitudes uh, actually creates a different bonding structure that's gonna create a slightly different charge on every single collided ice crystal at these altitudes. Um, these are nice theories. There has been no experimental evidence to suggest that this is actually how it works. Um, so there's a lot to think about still here. Okay, so now we have um, a feel for how the charge distribution in our thunder cloud looks. So let's move into the uh, lightning discharge itself. How does this charge distribution create um, a big flash of light? Well, lightning discharges generally are, cat are grouped into four discrete chunks, four things happen in your typical thunder uh, lightning discharge. These are corona, streamer, stepped leaders, and return strokes. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk through each one of these uh, sequentially, show you what it means. So corona discharge. <clears throat> you, you, may have, you may know that um, Earth's atmosphere is a poor conductor. You won't just see electrons, the current flowing through the air all the time. But air can be made to conduct electricity, and all that's needed is a strong enough electric field, a breakdown field. Um, typically, the electric field down here at ground at, uh, at sea level, necessary um, to <coughs> cause electrons to flow through the air, is about six times ten to the six volts per meter. Um, and up in the middle of a thunderstorm, that's, that drops to about 1.6 times 10 to the 6. So on the order of 10 to the 6 volts per meter. Um, but the maximum electric fields that we've observed within thunderclouds are just about 1 times 10 to the 5th volts per meter, a full order of magnitude less than what we would need in order to uh, get breakdown 
occurring. And um, yet we do see breakdown occurring in thundery clouds. Why would this happen? Well, um, imagine here uh, a uniform electric field. Let's say it's 10 to the fifth volts per meter, so what we would see in a thundercloud. Why would there be a, uh, an electric field in a thundercloud? Well, that's because there's a lot of charge there. Um, but it's not going to be enough to cause breakdown. But what if we insert a pointed conductor into the electric field? Um, then what we see is that the field lines are going to um, bend and uh, enter the pointed object perpendicularly. And at the pointed end right here within the blue dotted circle, um, you're going to see a region of higher electric field because these lines are closer together. Um, within this region, we actually will observe uh, an electric field of great enough magnitude to cause breakdown, but only in this localized region. Um, this is what is going to happen here is that an electron avalanche is going to form. So um, one electron is going to be accelerated by the electric field. It's going to strike an atom. It's going to have enough energy to actually inject another electron <coughs> along with the original le electron. So now we have two high energy electrons. Um, the electric field is going to keep accelerating them. Now we'll get four and eight, and it'll keep propagating like this in electron avalanche. And um, these collisions and recombinations are going to give rise to um, light that we'll see. And uh, this is known as corona discharge. It looks like this. Um, of course, going back for one second, why would there be pointed objects with a, uh, a thundercloud? Well, this is kind of the second big we don't know section of the talk. Um, there's lots of theories about how perhaps ice crystals are pointy enough. Um, one of the predominant or the leading theories right now is that <coughs> the two ice particles actually collide with each other. Um, they momentarily create a sort of elongated shape with pointy ends, kind of an oval with points. Um, and that is enough to momentarily create uh, the breakdown necessary to begin in the lightning discharge. Okay, so um, here's an example of some actual corona discharge. Um, <clears throat> what we have going on here is that we have two electric uh, wire, high, high voltage electric wires, so there's a lot of electric field in the area. And then we have some um, sharp edges going around here, and we see the purple corona discharge um, occurring right there. Uh, this uh, <coughs> has another name. You might have heard of it referred to as St. Elmo's Fire. Um, sailors at sea saw this, uh, these little purple balls floating on their masts, of the purple like fire floating on their masts and were you know, taken aback. Um, and they, they thought it was a sign from the patron saint of sailors, St. Erasmus of Formula. And so uh, they named it St. Elmo's Fire. This is like a pretty um, pervasive idea within literature and history. In fact, uh, Act 1, Scene 2 of The Tempest, uh, for Shakespeare fans out there, talks about St. Elmo's Fire. So there it is. But we have a problem. St. Elmo's Fire is very localized, this corona discharge. It's, it's also known as point discharge because it exists only within that small region of field <coughs> enhancement. How does, the dis how does the discharge propagate outside of that region? And the answer has to do with um, streamers. So you'll remember that what we have going on inside our region of field enhancement is um, electron avalanches. That is, lots of electrons flowing in one direction together, lots of free electrons. And it turns out that these free electrons themselves are going to create um, an electric field strong enough that coupled with the background electric field, these two can actually cause breakdown to occur in background electric fields uh, as low as 10 to the fifth volts per meter. So the electron avalanche can continue to cause breakdown in front of it in, a, in background electric fields that we would observe within a thundercloud. And this sort of, of uh, breakdown is known as a streamer discharge. You see on the screen here, um, we have sort of a round conductor up here. Um, there has before the, uh, the, this is sort of three time steps. Um, and before this, a corona discharge occurred. And now what we're getting is streamers. So streamers are transient, weakly conducting filaments, charged particles, um, and they usually could be about 10 centimeters in length, or a few tens of centimeters in length, rather. And they are able to propagate short distances in background fields on the order of 10 to the 5 volts per meter. Um, here we have three time steps. 
uh, as you can see, the streamers are growing away from the conductor. Um, this tens, this uh, scale here um, is 10 centimeters in each, so it's getting a lot bigger. And all these electrons are actually propagating out in these little lines. Now you'll notice that um, as the streamers grow, there are tons and tons of tendrils that are going to form, right? But all of them have to share the same initial stem. And like uh, lots and lots of electrons uh, squeezing through the filament of a light bulb and getting quite hot, um, this stem is going to get hotter and hotter. And when it gets to about 2,000 Kelvin, it'll switch from being this um, transient weakly conducting filament to being um, a leader, which is a highly conducting plasma um, uh, filament that's highly charged. <clears throat> so we can step through the process now. Initial corona discharge gives rise to, to, to a streamer burst. All these little streamer tendrils shoot out. Um, the streamer stem gets hotter and hotter <coughs> until it turns into a leader, which becomes highly conducting. <coughs> this highly conducting leader plasma channel actually has enough charge on its own, even without a background electric field of any um, sufficient strength, to cause more uh, streamer bursts. The streamer burst is going to give rise to um, another streamer stem that gets hotter and hotter. And as you can see, um, that'll turn into a leader and the process will keep stepping on. And, as, uh, and so leaders are often referred to as step leaders. They typically grow um, in 10 to 100 meter discrete steps every 20 to 50 microseconds. They meander all throughout the atmosphere coming down from a thunderclap. Here is a um, picture of leaders. You can see I've sort of drawn one straight line. That's not how it is in real life. We're, we're going to get a whole bunch of different um, leader channels. And they're going to meander all, to, all throughout the atmosphere down to the ground until finally one makes contact. And when one makes contact, we get a sudden clearing of all the charge that is built up along the leader channels, known as the return stroke. Um, in the return stroke, you can see that there is this <coughs> negative charge from the cloud, which has um, come down in the leaders and is all over the place. And all that is going to be able to flow to the ground instant, almost instantly when um, contact with the positive ground is made. So in this animation, what's going to happen is that <coughs> excuse me, um, the regions in which electrons are flowing very quickly are going to give rise to a lot of light because of the rapid ionization and recombination of the charge carriers, of fast moving charge carriers in the return stroke. And so this animation is going to actually highlight the regions in which charge carriers are moving um, in bright yellow so that you can see what the lightning strike would look like. So the charge carriers are going down, and as you can see, the yellow <coughs> lightning strike propagates upward. Let's watch it again. Notice that the bright yellow is only occurring where the charge leaders are moving. That, of course, is this ionization and recombination. Okay. So now what you've all been waiting for, here is a slow motion video of an actual lightning strike. Um, so what happens here is there is the streamers uh, give rise to leaders, and now we can begin to actually see the leaders. They meander all over the place, um, taking all sorts of funky paths uh, until after a while, one of them reaches the ground, flash. All of the charge clears and uh, flows to the ground. All the negative charge clears and flows to the ground. And it's going to continue to glow for quite a while after this initial return stroke. In fact, most lightning have, on average, three return strokes. And we've witnessed as many as 23. Um, what's going on here is that charge had, that um, all the charge in the negative charge center of the thundercloud has flowed down, or in a region of it anyways, has flowed down through the leader to the ground. Um, and now we have a big void a lot more charge will actually flow into that area um, and we'll get some subsequent um, clearing of charge, much, much um, smaller in scale than the initial one. But of course, we already have this channel of plasma that was formed, so why not? It's, it's pretty energetically favorable at this point. So um, a, few, a few benchmark figures for uh, return strokes and lightning, in general, lightning strikes in general. Within the return stroke, um, electrons typically travel very fast. Um, 0.3 to 0.5 times the speed of light. Um, the current supplied to the ground is about 30 kiloamps. 
Um, the return stroke channel it is usually heated to about 30,000 Kelvin. And the entire process of um, clearing charge takes place over about five and a half microseconds. So incredibly fast. You probably weren't able to really see the, um, the upward motion of the lightning strike in this uh, film, and that's because five and a half microseconds is very short even in this slope of motion. Um, overall, uh, the entire lightning strike se sequence um, can take place over a time of about 0 0.15 to 1100 milliseconds. The range is largely because um, we can have just one return stroke or we can have 23 return strokes. And um, most, the, the lowest and highest um, energies that we have observed lightning strikes delivered to the ground are um, 10 megajoules and 10 gigajoules. <coughs> 10 gigajoules, what is that? That's enough power to um, power your typical US home for three months. But how, where is this power coming from? We can actually use mechanics to get a good feel for this. Um, so what we're going to start with is we're going to look at the energy associated with just one single electron moving down through the leader. Um, you'll notice that I've used a relativistic version of energy, gamma mc squared, because um, we're moving at about half the speed of light. Um, now the total energy of the lightning strike is uh, going to be the energy of one electron times the number of electrons that make it to the ground. But how are we going to get the number of electrons that make it to the ground? Well, we rewrite that as the volume of electrons to get, that get to the ground times the volume density of electrons. So what do I mean by the volume? Well, imagine um, a very simple model. Our, light, our return stroke channel is going to be just this tube through which electrons can flow. Um, and uh, the electrons are going to be traveling at, let's, let's take a kind of average value. So the velocity of the electrons is going to be about 0.4 times the speed of light. Um, and the time at which they're moving, as you remember from the last slide, is going to be about five and a half microseconds. So we know this. Um, and so the distance that a typical electron is going to travel is going to be the product of the velocity and um, and the time that it takes. So if a typical electron will travel about tau times V um, meters, <coughs> if we do the unit conversion. So drawing a uh, scale here, um, we could say that any electron, so we'll put the cloud up here, the ground's gonna be down here, right? Um, any electron that is within this volume and below, that is tau times v, is going to make it to the ground. If an electron starts way up here near the cloud, it's going to, try, it's going to travel tau times v meters down, but it's not going to make it by the time the return stroke is over. Um, it's going to get stuck right there, so we don't want to count. We only want to count um, uh, electrons that start within here. So here's the volume we're concerned with. We already know the height, so the volume is going to be area um, times height. The height we know, tau times v, the area is going to be pi r squared. And from photographic evidence, we actually know that the radius here, um, r, is about one centimeter. So uh, we can write that the volume is just pi r squared times tau v, as I've done up there. And um, the only other piece of information that we need to know is the volume density of electrons, which um, we've shown experimentally to be um, about uh, 8 times 10 to the 17 um, inverse meters. Um, so now all we have to do is plug in all these numbers, and what we end up with is a total energy of about 15 gigajoules. Okay, so that's a little high. Um, as you might remember that the uh, energy range that we've observed is 10 megajoules to 10 gigajoules. Um, we can do a few things to this estimate, like uh, I chose 0.4 times the speed of light, but maybe 0.3 is actually more reasonable. Um, if we say 0.3, then we get down to 11 gigajoules, which is even more reasonable. We're definitely much more than on the order of magnitude. Um, but more than this, kind of intuitively, we would expect to be getting, uh, uh, not only is this a back of the envelope estimate, but we would expect to be getting something on the high end 
That's because um, we are ignoring in this formulation all the recombination. Actually, the lifetime of an electron is not going to be long enough to let it travel all the way from here to there. So all the electrons that start off here are not going to make it to the ground. We're going to lose some energy in this process. Um, and so what we'll expect to see is something less than what I've calculated there. But uh, still, this is, not, uh, this is not bad for getting a feel for where the energy comes from. OK, so now we know um, well, how thunderstorms form, what lightning is, why it occurs, and how it occurs. So I think it's time that we can go back to aircraft lightning interactions. <clears throat> so um, first off, uh, let's you know, return to the Quizlet. Uh, option C was not correct. Every aircraft, in fact, is struck um, once per year uh, by lightning. Uh, so about every 30,000 flying hours, uh, aircraft, your typical aircraft is going to be struck, um, which means that yeah, every year, every aircraft. Um, and uh, oh, he just left. But there was a person in this room um, who's actually been on an airplane that's been struck by lightning, and maybe there are more. I don't know. Um, oh, there is still one. Okay. Um, congratulations, Bear. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, answer C is not correct. Um, why, why would lightning strike an aircraft? Well, it makes sense actually because the air, remember, is a pretty poor conductor. Um, Any time that, uh, that lightning um, is going to travel from a cloud to the ground or from one charge center in a cloud to another charge center, um, if it can take a path through a metal conducting object like an aircraft, um, it's definitely going to. So that, that's energetically favorable. Aircraft do get struck by lightning and they do often. Um, and it turns out intercepted strikes, that is, the aircraft just turns out to be at the wrong place at the wrong time, only account for about 10% of lightning strikes. Um, it does happen, of course, um, but it's pretty unlikely. And, and what ends up actually being the case is that airplanes cause 90% of the lightning strikes that, um, that, uh, that strike them. Um, so why? Let's look at, <coughs> so answer B was indeed correct. Um, <coughs> here's one of the very few pictures. Um, it was taken uh, over an Air Force base in Japan during the winter. Um, and you'll notice this lightning is a little bit different. It actually looks upside down compared to the lightning we've seen. That's because most lightning in Japan actually transfers um, positive charge to the ground. Um, there's, there's something weird that we don't understand about the way lightning works in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna like Photoshop this and zoom in a little bit so you can see what's going on. Here what we can um, fairly clearly see is that lightning is going to, is entering the aircraft through its nose and exiting through the tail or vice versa. It doesn't matter. And um, that's because it, that, what that's called is a bi-directional leader. Uh, Bidirectional leader propagates in um, opposite directions. Oh, here, here's kind of a diagram. So, um, a bidirectional leader propagates in uh, directions opposite. No, sorry, it propagates in opposite directions with two heads of opposing polarity, um, and the negatively charged leader is going to travel um, towards the positively charged ground, um, while um, so that the negative charge can be neutralized. And the positive leader is going to burrow deeper into the negative charge center, um, which supplies charge to the negative leader. And so eventually, uh, <coughs> the negative charge center of the cloud and the positive ground are going to connect through this leader, and uh, lightning discharge is going to flow, as we see here. Now, uh, side note, I noted that this lightning is backwards. This is the normal type of lightning we would see here in the United States most of the time. Um, uh, just bear in mind. The, the picture is like the only one we have. There. Um, okay, <clears throat> so what are the consequences? What happens when an aircraft gets struck by lightning? Um, well, early aircraft, you probably just didn't fly through a thunderstorm. It really wasn't safe. Uh, they were often made of wood or very flimsy materials. Um, and also bad record keeping was, there was bad record keeping at the time. So uh, you might not have written down that you were actually struck by lightning. Um, you might have just been, you know, blowing to smithereens. Um, but more recently, uh, we have begun keeping much better records. Um, and so there are a few uh, kind of important cases in which lightning strikes have actually caused uh, 
uh, aircrafts to crash that um, I want to talk about. So two similar cases occurred, occurred um, with Pan Am flight, uh, flight 214, which was a Boeing 740, 707, like this one, um, <coughs> crashed outside of Elton, Maryland in 1963. Um, and similarly, Iranian Air Force Flight 48 to Boeing 747 uh, crashed outside of Madrid in 1976. In both these cases, lightning struck the aircraft and seconds later, they exploded and crashed to the ground. Um, what later turned out to be the case was that small sparks had formed um, across gaps in the aircraft's skin uh, near fuel tanks, and this had caused <coughs> combustion. A completely different type of incident, <coughs> accident, um, was in 1988 when uh, Nuremberg Airlines Flight uh, 108, which was uh, Fairchild Swearage in Metroliner 3, a 19 passenger. Um, turboprop aircraft, aircraft crashed outside of Dusseldorf. Um, in this case, uh, lightning struck the airplane, and about three minutes later, the aircraft broke apart in the air and crashed. And uh, what was later turned out to be the case, we think, is that uh, although there was no external damage to the airplane, uh, the strong electric field that occurred within the aircraft actually uh, messed up the uh, flight controls to, uh, to such a degree that the people inside were no longer able to control the airplane. But the good news is that there has not been a crash in the United States since 1963, that was this one, um, and these two are like the lone other crashes that have occurred since then in the world at large. We have a really safe <coughs> system of air travel, and um, that is basically because we know how to build better air um, airplanes are um, basically uh, Faraday cages, and uh, what, if you might remember from EM, um, a Faraday cage is simply a, a conductor, a hollow conductor, um, and you can actually charge, you can put this conductor in as large an electric field as you want, um, but the interior, the hollow interior, is not going to um, see any electric field at all. The, the exterior can be as charged as it wants. Um, this, uh, this is very similar to what an airplane is. It's basically a hollow tube of aluminum, metal. And uh, so building a better Faraday cage helps on two accounts. First, um, <coughs> this, this type of inc incident, um, it of course shields the passengers and the um, electrical equipment from the electric field that is caused by lightning uh, coursing through the body of the airplane. And in, in this kind of case, it makes sure that every part is grounded together well so that uh, current never has to jump between components. What was found specifically in the Iran Air Force um, case was that there were small plastic washers that had been inserted um, between screws and uh, the skin of the aircraft. And just that little gap that they created caused a, uh, a spark and that ignited. <coughs> Um, now, that's not to say that airplanes always get off scot-free in a lightning strike. In fact, in about half of incidents, um, repairs have to be made. Uh, usually these involve uh, that the paint got burned away in the area of the lightning strike. Um, also, the uh, nose cone, which is where the radar in, is usually stored in most aircraft, um, has to be made out of uh, composites and uh, non-conducting materials because that would, metal would create a radar signature which would defeat the purpose of having a radome up there. Um, so what often actually occurs is the radome will get kind of um, disfigured in a lightning strike. That's okay, the airplane can still fly, but it'll have to get repaired. Um, it's also important to note that um, today, uh, Airplanes are increasingly being made out of composites. Most airplanes that you'll fly on are made to some degree out of composites, and some are made almost completely out of them. And the way we've gotten around this is that we embed metal meshes inside of the, um, inside of the composite skin, which allows this um, conducting to still happen. So I'd um, like to conclude there and um, say that in the end, the verdict is airplanes are safe. Uh, <laughs> Next time that uh, you go out in the thunderstorm and watch the spectacular show, um, 
please spend more time worrying about um, these like open questions. What causes the charge separation? Why why is there initial breakdown? It, 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 these are open questions that um, consider that um, deserve some serious thought. But um, don't worry about the people flying in the airplanes. They'll be okay. So. Um, Thank you. I'd like to acknowledge, uh, in particular, my comps advisor, Marty Baylor, um, and my peer advisor, Chris Winter, um, as well as my academic advisor, Ms. Melissa Evelyn Zayas. Um, I'd also like to thank Bill for providing a, a figurative shoulder to cry into when the thermo wasn't making any sense. And um, thank you to everyone who came out. Um, I know a lot of you skipped practice, and some of you even flew from California, where it's probably like 70 degrees warmer. So um, thank you very much for coming. And Cal. Um, so thank you. And I'm happy to take some questions. So I have, a, I have one question. Um, in the studies that you did, especially with the charge distribution, is there anything that you learned that would help explain why we don't see thunderstorms in the winter time? Yeah, so, um, well, the main, actually the, the main reason why we don't see thunderstorms in the winter time has to do with um, the fact that there's not enough, uh, uh, there's not enough moisture in the air, um, one, and two, that the sun doesn't warm the ground enough in the winter because it's cold all the time. Um, so we actually just don't get uh, these warm crusts of air rising is, is the main thing. Um, clouds still do form, but they don't tend to have enough, um, <coughs> there doesn't tend to be enough moisture um, to have enough latent heat to keep this uh, warm moist motion all the way up to the LED. Yes? Uh, so you said that 90% of airplane lightning strikes were because the plane itself actually caused the strike and 10% were just wrong place, wrong time. Mm -hmm. How do you distinguish between the two? Um, so it mostly has to do with the way that pilots uh, uh, experience it and we talk to them and see uh, what they say. So in the, in the wrong place, wrong time incidents, there's no warning. Basically what happens is suddenly out of the blue there's a white flash. Well, that would be great. There's a white flash. Um, and, um, but in the, uh, remember that I said that uh, that in order to create field enhancement, you need a uh, uh, pointed metal or conducting object. What is an airplane but a pointed conducting object? Um, as the as an aircraft flies through a uh, thundercloud and it's creating a lot of electric field enhancement, they'll actually kind of see the St. Elmo's fire appearing in front of their windscreen and. Um, and all over the place. So, uh, and, and in fact, they usually, before um, the aircraft induces lightning strike, they'll get their radios, will, or their radios will go silent for a few minutes because of the interference. So it's basically by pulling them and seeing what percentage is what you Carolyn? Yeah, when you were trying the, the two <coughs> electrons on the board, um, with that Yeah. Well, like, uh, that cylinder is like one centimeter. Is there any reason why you would expect it to be that small? Because I mean, like, yeah. It's and it's actually interesting because uh, there's um, there's not been all that many studies. We've done, you know, photo uh, photographic <coughs> stuff, and uh, they used to think it was bigger because it's really hard to take photographs of lightning and not overexpose it. Um, but uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I'm not really sure why uh, it, why it ends up being that skinny. Except, yeah, I'm not really sure why it ends up being that skinny. Walter, uh, in your research, did you find any like significant differences between the way lightning is caused in a thunderstorm versus something like ash being blown out of a volcano or? So. Um, I think that what's going on in ash being uh, blown out of a volcano is that you put all this uh, particulate matter in the air <coughs> that actually has a lot of pointed ed edges and it creates great regions um, for uh, field enhancement and breakdown to occur. <coughs> so it's basically the same mechanism, we're just sort of like flooding the area with um, places that breakdown can occur. And so it occurs lower. 
Stephen. Um, so you said that pointed ice like collisions may yeah. cause the field tension, but is ice isn't like a great conductor. Is it just good yeah. enough that it works? It's um, compared to the air, it's good enough that it works. Yeah. The air is such a bad conductor. Um, but yeah, that's that's all it is. Something called heat lightning. Um. Um, I, I have to. <laughs> it appears that heat lightning is just um, a word for lightning that is far away. There is I don't. I don't believe that there is any um, scientific difference between heat lightning and other lightning. Um, and it's usually cloud to cloud. It's not striking the ground, so you just kind of see it on the horizon, and there's these little flashes of heat. Lightning. <laughs> I know you just might not, you might not know the answer to this, but what's up in Japan? Yeah, well, um, <laughs> there, yeah, it's, it's really serious. <laughs> I, I, I've been reading a lot about this, but I, um, right now we, there's whole sections in various books that, have, that, that are devoted to um, the problem of winter lightning in Japan. And the and the key the, the thing here is that it's not necessarily like necessarily it's like something about Japan. Um, probably this happens other places. We just haven't observed it. There happen to be there's not that many lightning physicists in the world. There happen to be a um, number in Japan right now. Um, so they've observed a lot. Uh, one thing that we think is that uh, the nature of um, there, there's a certain weather pattern that comes in in the winter, and it really violently um, under, it's a cold, violent undercutting of um, the atmosphere, and what that basically does <coughs> is it uh, pushes air up um, more than you would expect other places. Uh, also, because it's winter, the, everything is lower, so, our, so the clouds end up um, forming on much smaller scales. And I think, it, I think what they think is that um, since they're so much shorter, the positive charge center at the top is actually free to um, make lightning all the way down to the ground, where that doesn't happen very much um, where, when it's all the way up to 12 kilometers in the air. But yeah, a lot of stuff to do there. But positive charges. Um, so, uh, yeah, classic physics. Um, <laughs> I, I think what is in essence yeah. going on here is that negative charge is moving right. in the okay. opposite direction. Just, you know, we talk about it the other way because we don't want to flip our paradigm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you.